Thank you very much. It's my great honor to be here. My talk today is called, is called Crossing Borders with Free Culture. I would like this talk to be in memory of Alan Turing. Alan was generally considered to be the father of modern day computer science. In 1935, before any such thing as modern day computers were created, he wrote some of the first papers on stored program computers. He was a mathematician, a cryptographer, a code breaker, and a war hero. And this is the 100th anniversary of his birth this year. For those of you who have heard about free software, a lot of you people think that I'm a guy who goes around with a long white beard and long white hair, saying ho, 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 and giving away free software. <laughs> well, I'm also one of the people who recognize that this free software was not only a hobbyist type of thing, it was not only a thing done by people in universities, but had something that was deep commercial value to people around the world. And that's how I really got involved with Linux in the first place. Linux is what we call free software, but recently there's also been concepts of free hardware and other free culture, which we'll get into later on in the talk. Now, for Western countries and countries which have solved the, signed the Geneva Convention, things like that, we have in law something known as a copyright. It is the right of any author or person who creates something to have the right to say what happens to that. And I believe in that very strongly. Uh, the problem is, in, in law, after you have the copyright, you typically then give a license to somebody to use it in a particular way whether it's they're going to pay you money for it, or whether it's to guide the way that it's used, or whatever. That license gives the user certain rights to the particular act or the particular item. And that's typically hard to do. It usually uses lots of lawyers and things like that. And so consequently, there was a person named Richard Stallman who developed a concept of a free and open license, which we've kind of nicknamed copy left to be able to give people the ability to use this software uh, for free and in a free way. Now, when we talk about software, we talk about free software. Unfortunately, there's this concept of free as in freedom versus free as in gratis. For people who are not used to writing software, you take a language that you may have heard of, like Fortran or COBOL or C or some other, this is a human readable type of language. It converted into the ones and zeros that the computer can understand. Without that human readable form, you can't change the software to meet your needs. You can't show other people how to use it better. You can't make changes to it that people need. You can't redistribute those changes. And you're typically limited to using the software the same way that the producer of the software wanted you to use it. This means that you, as a user, have lost control of your software. And what software freedom gives you is it gives you that control back. You can now make the decision to change the software into something that you want, into something that perhaps the producer never even thought of as a way of using it. Now, in all of these, no one has ever said that you shouldn't be able to make money doing this. And so people say, well, how do I make money with free software? Remember, it's freedom software. If we take a look at the jobs that people typically have with closed source software, software which you don't have access to the source code for, there are jobs like programming. I can write programs. I can use closed source software to create those programs. I could be a systems analyst. I could be telling people how to use their software better. I could be a systems administrator taking care of that software for other people. I could be a product manager saying how you make a business out of that, how you charge for that, how you make an opportunity, a company out of that. I could be a technical marketing manager explaining to customers what the value of that software is, why they should be using it. I could be teaching people how to use it, either commercially or through a public institution, a university of some type. I could be a consultant having people be able to do a better business by using software. And I could be an integrator pulling together hardware and software to help a business or a government solve their problems. Now, I can do all of these things with free software. 
I'm not selling the software as a product, but I'm selling my services to the people to understand and use the software better. But with free software, there's one more thing I can do that I couldn't do with closed source proprietary software, and that's I can change it to meet the customer's needs better. Now, this brings about the first border that we went across, borders on countries. I, work, I live in a very strange country, the United States of America. I love my country, but it is strange. And a lot of times we don't think about things in other people's countries because we live in the United States. Uh, we don't think about the local jobs that closed source proprietary software prevents in other countries because a lot of the software is created in the United States. It's created by companies like Microsoft and Oracle. And so we don't think anything about moving to Silicon Valley or Seattle. But when you go to another country, you have to think about students who are at university being trained in computer science, and where do they get the good jobs they want to go to? A lot of these students feel the only time they can get a good job is if they move to the United States. And therefore, there's a brain drain, a movement of people out of these countries to the United States or Western Europe, Germany, for example, because they feel that's the place to get a good job. You also have to think about security of a country. Again, in the United States, we don't think anything about this because, after all, Bill Gates is a loyal U.S. citizen. But if you are in the Chinese military, you might think twice about putting a closed source program inside your tanks, your planes, or your ships, because you don't know what type of Trojan horses might be in that closed source piece of software. Well, what happens if the United States creates an embargo against you and says, we're not going to let you use this software anymore. We're not going to give you the training you need. There's a little country off the coast of Florida, you may have heard of it, called Cuba. And the United States has had an embargo against Cuba for 40 years. That means that Fidel Castro cannot call up Bill Gates and say, Hey, Bill, I have a problem with my software. You fix it, I'll give you a box of cigars. Because even if Bill Gates is, you know, wanted to help Fidel, he couldn't because he's a loyal U.S. citizen and we have an embargo against Cuba. But if Fidel wanted to use free and open source software, software is not controlled by any country, software which is developed all around the world, they could. And they could fix it, and they could train their own students to be able to fix that software and make it better. And this gives economic stability and longevity to their software. Finally, there's the issue of balance of trade. Some of these countries are sending billions of dollars outside of their country every year to my country just to buy this software, when instead they could pull a lot of this software down from the internet along with the source code and pay people inside of their country, programmers inside of their country, to, tr to change it and make it needs better. Billions of dollars spent inside of their country. And if you use the economics in anything, a dollar that is kept locally is worth $10 sent outside. So let's talk about the borders of economic laws. A lot of you have heard of software piracy. Vietnam, for instance, has a 96% piracy rate on PC software. Brazil has an 84%. Japan, or China, used to have 96%, but after the World Trade Organization got after them, they got it down to 84%. And the United States, the richest country in the world, has a piracy rate of 34% on their PC desktop software. Now, why do people pirate software? You know, why don't they just pay for it like they pay for lots of other things? Well, you know, you go to Vietnam where the person's making an average of four US dollars a day, and you say, you have to be on the internet. You have to have computers. You need this to do your, your work. And they can go, and they can typically find a cast off computer, an old one, they could bring it in, but the software to go on it costs them hundreds and hundreds of dollars. You know, and if I was stuck between this rock and this hard place, I'd put a patch on my eye and go, R, 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 matey. Because they can go down to their local store, the local piracy store, and they can get the same disk that Microsoft might charge $400 for, for, for $2. I said that in a conference one time, and from the back of the room, this voice said, $1! 
and I knew I had a tough negotiator. <laughs> now, if you're in one of these countries that's trying to build a software industry up, you see a tall path in front of you. You say, how do I train my programmers to work with the software? How can I do this? How can I catch up to these other countries? But if you use free software, you can go to the internet, and you can find modern day operating systems that you can use for free. You're not pirating this software. It's given to you freely. And you can't steal something which is given to you. And you can contribute to this on your own economic level. You, you know, if you're in Vietnam, a day's worth of programming by a Vietnamese programmer is worth the same amount as a day's worth of programming by a US programmer. Is that the US programmer asks $200 or $300 an hour versus what you need to ask in Vietnam. This also allows countries to develop their own local expertise in attracting new business. Because new business, new technological businesses will not come to a country unless they can find enough good programmers to sustain them. I believe, in a lot of times, in this world, we have problems with the word freedom. We've forgotten what freedom really means. So I often now talk about software slavery. When you're a slave, you're told where to go, what to do, who to marry, when to have children. You don't own anything. When you're a software slave, you're told when to install the software, when to update the software, how many people can use it, what machines it goes on, and you have no choice. You have no control. Freedom is control. Control of your life, control of what you want to do. And with software freedom, you get software control. I started programming in 1969. That's one of the first computer systems I ever programmed on. Two and a half million US dollars for one half megabyte of RAM and a CPU that's laughably slow today. We called it a mainframe. My 180 megabyte disk cost 32,000 US dollars, the same price as a four bedroom house in those days. But today, you can buy a complete computer system on the bottom called a Raspberry Pi. It has 512 megabytes of memory and a 32 gigabyte flash disk. It's a complete computer system for $35. What this does is move into the hands of every young person in the world the ability to understand how a computer system works. It runs the Linux operating system, free software. You get all the source code for it. Imagine your students designing and building circuits like this and then calling into manufacturers to manufacture them and create jobs that are local. A multiplier effect. Here are some of my young friends I've met over the years. All of them have done very amazing things. None of them were trained in computer science at a university, but learned what they needed to do by going onto the internet and looking at the source code that other people have written and given away freely. I'll introduce you to only two of them. In the lower left-hand corner, this young man who at the University of Helsinki in 1991 decided he was going to write the kernel of an operating system just for fun, just as a hobby. That operating system was Linux. And I'm glad to say that I'm the godfather of his children. His name is Linus Torvalds. And today, he leads the free software world with the Linux operating system. The other person I'd like to introduce it's a young black man at the bottom. He lives in Soweto, South Africa, a very poor town of 500,000 people. I went there one time and I said, I think that there are people in Soweto that know about free software. And a member of the government laughed at me and said, not in Soweto. They don't even know what a computer is. I said, I think people here need broadband. He laughed again. No, nobody has need for a broadband network in Soweto. But then they went back and looked, and they found this young man who was running a consulting company out of his house doing dial-up networking. He was consulting with Linus, helping him fix a bug in the AMD memory system inside the Linux kernel. And the government was so surprised that they opened up an open source development center in Soweto. The final border I'm going to talk about is borders of diversity. I have been very lucky in my life to have been part of the computer industry, an industry that was very inclusive. Whether you were a man or woman, whether you were black or white or oriental, 
The computer industry had some of the first diversity laws in the U.S. history. This had an immense effect on a lot of things, especially with free software, because when you're in the free software, nobody asks you whether you're young or old, white or black, male or female. They don't ask you, you know, what, what religion you are. It's only, show me the code. And that's why my young friends were able to go as far and as fast as they wanted to go, because nobody said no to them. Instead, they said, here it is. You have questions? Ask. All we ask is that the questions be intelligent. Recently, I had another border that I crossed. At the age of 61 years, I decided to come out about my homosexuality. And I found another very accepting community on the internet that said, thank you very much. One of the reasons why I came out was that there were a lot of young people that were committing suicide because of something that they had no choice in. And I wanted to show them that besides being a geek, it's okay to also be homosexual. Now, I love free and open source software because when you use closed source software, you cannot see who created the software. Only a company's name is there. But with free software, you can see the individual contributors. And because of this, I'm very interested in seeing who produces the software of the future. I want to talk with them, I want to see them, I want to skim them off of the top, just like cream is skimmed off of milk, rising to the top. I forgot to mention one thing. Alan Turing, the father of computer science, the war hero, the person who solved the German Enigma code, the person who changed the direction of World War II, was also homosexual. And so I do not know where the next Alan Turing of computer science is going to come from. But I'll tell you one thing. I'm not so egotistical to think that they're going to come from the United States whether they're going to be male, whether they're going to be Christian, or Jew, or Islam. I'm not so egotistical because I don't know where they're going to come from. They may come from China or Germany or even as unlikely a place as Helsinki, Finland. And all I know is that with free software, we'll be able to see them and be able to capture them. So if you'd like to find out more about free software, there's lots of places you can go to on the net to find out about it. I am working on a project in Brazil called Project Kawa. Hopefully, we'll generate more jobs for more independent business people, privately funded. Thank you very much.